Hello, I'm Bo Weidemer. This is the second video in a series on consequential modeling in lifecycle inventory analysis. In this video, we will focus on the ISO 14044 as a standard for consequential LCA. As I mentioned in the previous video, LCA can be seen as a matter of social responsibility. LCA is regulated in the ISO 14000 series on environmental management systems, particularly the ISO 14044. This is the standard that explains the requirements and guidelines. Social responsibility is fundamental to the ISO 14000 series. The fact that actors should be responsible for the consequences of their production and consumption actions. This is reflected in the ISO 14040 and 44 in such a way that we can conclude that it can be seen as a standard for consequential LCA. Let's start by looking at the introduction. It says that LCA can assist in identifying opportunities to improve, to inform decision makers for the purpose of strategic decisions, select relevant indicators, or for marketing. Marketing, as you know, is with the intention to make people buy a product. So making a decision to make a purchase, which in this case should be a purchase to improve the environment. So all the different application mentions have aspects of improvements, that is changes. When we wrote the original standard back in 1998, we didn't think of attributional LCA as an option. That term wasn't invented until 2001, and it wasn't defined until 2011. So we didn't think neither of consequential nor attributional LCA. We simply described how to do LCA. And of course, when you make a standard, you don't make a standard that can be interpreted in many different ways. You try to make a standard that is prescriptive. That's the whole purpose of standardization. So one of the principles is called the priority of scientific approach. It says that decisions in LCA should be preferably based on natural science. If this is not possible, other scientific approaches from social and economic sciences may be used or international conventions may be referred to. Only if that is not possible, you could make decisions based on value choices. So obviously the standard says don't do normative choices if you can avoid it. In 2006, an annex was added to ISO 14040, explaining the applications of life cycle assessment, aiming at environmental improvements, which is basically the overall focus of the ISO 14000 series of environmental management. Therefore, the annex goes on, the products and processes studied in an LCA are those affected by the decision that the LCA intends to support. This is exactly what we're doing with consequential LCA. But then the annex goes on to lament that different approaches to LCA have developed during the recent years, one of which assigns elementary flows and potential environmental impacts to a specific product, typically as an account of the history of the product. This is, of course, a description of attributional LCA. So, essentially, the standard here explains that we now have two ways of doing LCA, the originally intended consequential LCA and the attributional version. Now, the standard is actually also quite clear on the actual procedures to use, for example, when linking to intermediate inputs. It says that the supplementary processes to be added to the systems must be those that would actually be involved when switching between the analyzed systems. And to identify this, it's necessary to know which of the unconstrained suppliers or technologies 
has the highest and lowest production costs and consequently is the marginal supplier or technology when the demand for this supplementary product is generally decreasing or increasing respectively. Now considering that this was written back in 1998, it's actually a surprisingly complete and precise description of what we do when we link unit processes in a consequential modeling. Likewise, on the topic of co-production, the standards are quite clear. It says that wherever possible, allocation should be avoided by dividing the unit processes, when that's possible, of course, and else to expand the product system to include the additional functions related to the co-products. Now that is exactly what we're doing in consequential LCA. We're subdividing the unit processes when we have combined production and that makes it possible to divide. And we expand the system in cases of joint production. We don't do allocation, which is mentioned only as a later option in the allocation hierarchy. The standard goes on to say that the inventory should be based on material balances between inputs and outputs. It states this as a fact, and that allocation procedures should therefore approximate as much as possible such fundamental input-output relationships and characteristics. In consequential LCA, we have a modeling procedure that allows always to maintain material balances, which is not possible in, in attributional LCA. So what is reflected in these quotes is that the study of potential impacts must necessarily imply modeling changes resulting from potential decisions. That is, modeling marginal changes when the study changes are small and incremental changes when the changes are larger, as opposed to the average modeling implied in the delimitation of value chains and supply chains. For both marginal and incremental modeling, the text of ISO 14049 applies, namely that supplementary processes to be added to the systems must be those that would actually be involved when switching between the analyzed systems. With regard to the scale of change, we could be more precise by defining exactly what we mean by small scale. A change that does not affect the determining parameters of the overall market situations. That is, it is marginal in the sense that it doesn't change the direction of the trend in the market, doesn't change the constraints on or the production costs of the involved products and technologies, and therefore we can do marginal modeling. Large scale changes, on the other hand, is a change that does affect the determining parameters. So either the direction or trend in the market volume or the constraints or the production costs of the involved products and technologies. In that case, we need to apply incremental modeling. When we talk about cause effect modeling of average marginal or incremental changes, we can illustrate that with this graph between that shows the relation between inputs and outputs as a nonlinear curve. Now the average is a line between the zero and the uh, operating point, while the marginal is the tangent to the curve. The incremental is the line between the operating point before the change and the operating point after the change. Now, when you have a small scale change, then you can use the marginal. And when you have the larger changes, you need to take into account that the curve will have a different slope. The average is only relevant when you're really looking at the average situation, which is not relevant for changes at all. So consequential modeling is relevant for both marginal and incremental changes, but only marginal changes can currently be modeled systematically in an LCA database. And that is because in a marginal situation, whether you increase or decrease 
it'll be the same activities that are always affected. But when you have larger changes, you can ad in advance predict what size that change will have and therefore the slope of the curve. So that will have to be modeled individually in every case. Now, small changes may actually have large effects. Large long-term changes may be the consequence of the sum of many small decisions. So when I buy, for example, a liter milk in the supermarket, that can both have small short-term consequences, but it can also have long-term consequences on investments. Because the information that I'm sending when I'm buying a liter of milk is an information that will be added to all the other consumers' purchases to send the signal to the producers that the demand is increasing. And that means that there will be investments made on basis of that information. So consequential, consequential modeling is as relevant for small decisions as for larger decisions. Now, one of my colleagues used this picture to illustrate that in a pond, when you throw a pebble, you will actually be able to see the ripple effects, so the consequences. But he argued that in a stormy sea, which is the typical situation in the economic world where a lot of things are changing at the same time, then you wouldn't be able to see the consequences of even throwing a large rock in the, in the sea. So um, the argument there was that since we cannot see the changes, they don't exist, or at least we cannot model them. My argument is that as long as our model is correct, the ripples will still be there even if we can't see them. As you know, when different waves are meeting each other, the net effect of those waves will still be visible in the model, even though they won't be visible as such in the stormy sea. So if our modeling is correct, it is applicable whether we can see it or not. And that leads, of course, to the question of verification of LCA. Can we? Actually verify an LCA. Probably we can never verify the whole system that we're analyzing because that's basically the world. But what we can validate or verify is the individual data points that we're using and the individual model elements that we're using. So we can show that there is a cause effect relationship between certain, certain steps in our modeling. But that doesn't mean that we can verify the resulting systems. But as long as we can verify that the model works as it should, then that is as close as we can get to a real modeling. Now, that of course requires that the model does not contain normative elements. You cannot verify a allocation factor, for example, because that's a normative choice. But all the consequential model elements and individual data points can be verified. This was the end of the second video. There are still eight to go.